Hello everybody and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hansen. Thank you for being here. This is an interview with Aaron Lindy, who recently left 343 but was the lead narrative designer for Halo Infinite. Mainly dealing with the sandbox, dealing with the dialogue, the battle chatter, stuff like that. The grunts, we talk a lot about that in this interview. If you want more insight into the writing process for the sandbox of Halo Infinite, this is the interview for you. But we also talk about Aaron Lindy's past, where he was the lead writer on Battleborn from Gearbox. He was at Bungie for a little bit. And if you don't want to hear about those things, for your convenience, we've added timestamps to the entire interview so you can jump to exactly the discussion that you'd like to hear. If you appreciate that, we'd always appreciate it if you subscribe to MinMax's YouTube channel. You can also jump over to Patreon where you can unlock the podcast version of this interview, all of our other interviews by supporting us at patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. And since we mentioned it in the beginning of the interview, we just completed the deepest dive on Halo Infinite, which is the best, most thorough discussion about that game's campaign on the internet. Check it out on MinMax's YouTube channel. We'd appreciate it. Okay, without further ado, here's Aaron. Aaron Lindy, welcome to MinMax, sir. Hello, my friend. How are you? Good. It's nice to have you here. Uh, we talked nice about you here. an awful lot during the deepest dive on Halo Infinite that we did, the big thorough discussion. I feel like it was at least 40% of the discussion was just talking about you <laughs> and your history and theorizing. I I recall when, when we were watching it, my wife uh, started shouting when you said, uh, welcome to the deep dive on Aaron Lindy. She's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. That's, yes, that was that was uh, that was lovely to see. I'm, I'm very pleased that you guys enjoyed the game. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, is that frustrating or fun to just comb through so much feedback for Halo Infinite? Let's focus. Let's, oh, my God. Narciss no, it's 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 insane. It's absolutely insane. No, it's 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 there is no way frustrating. It's it's wild to be like because I've, I've been, you know. Uh, I, I've had people react to work before, but never on the scale of Halo. Like yeah. never, never with the audience reach that that Halo has. So that, like, I've become the most narcissistic person. I have like my most frequent um, uh, Google or excuse me, uh, Twitter search is Halo grunts because I just want to see people react to it, and it's been so lovely to see. Like, it's it's been really great. Uh, I I it I it bowls me over every single time. So th so everything you guys were talking about, I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. And I'm like, this is the most surreal experience of my life by far. So uh, what about I mean, do you also search for like the Halo lore experts, like diving in deep on what they think is going on, theorizing or mainly like just I hope people laughed at the grunt VO and then I'm good. You know, it, it's 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 been all up. Right. I mean, yeah. like seeing people engage with with um, with the game at every level has been has been supremely rewarding. Like, obviously, I'm going to look for all the stuff that that uh, that myself and Jeff Easterling touched. And 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 I, I want to see people reacting to uh, to talking grunts a lot. That's where, you know, as a comedy writer, that's been like the greatest source of enjoyment for me. But, yeah, no, it's it's um, I, I was. I, I routinely find myself ill prepared at how deeply engaged Halo fans are and how uh, even the most like like, for example, um, without going into detail on it further, because I don't want to uh, fuel further speculation. But the um, uh, but uh, but Spartan locks uh, helmet on yeah. Hyperius's armor, uh, people losing their shit over that stuff. Like I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. This is Halo. And there are legions of people that are going to dissect the, the smallest decisions that were made. Uh, uh, and and there is no <laughs> there is no overestimating um, the uh, uh, the tenacity of that fan base. It's it's really incredible. What uh, what was your reaction to all the articles about you leaving? Uh, it was amazing Ooh, that they're all getting out there. Is that it fall into well, the narcissistic umbrella as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, that that was uh, yeah, a little bit. That was that was kind of a trip. It happened. Um, uh, it, it, I, I had a couple of. I think Polygon ran a piece about me leaving Gearbox when I left Gearbox, and I thought that was strange until I realized, oh, because it, it's shortly after. Because when I left Gearbox, I wasn't like depart. I wasn't running away from anything except Texas. I just wasn't really great at Texas. I started sweating the minute I got down to Texas, and I stopped sweating the minute that I left. <laughs> and um, uh, it, but, you know, but I didn't want to like engage with with everybody and say like, no, 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 this is not. But I could see why. You know, it was. I could. I, I guess I could see why that was newsworthy without newsworthy without like acknowledging that it had anything to do with me whatsoever. And that's yeah. kind of how I feel uh, about the, <laughs> the slew of articles that came out about my departure. Primarily, like what I wanted to do was correct everybody. I was like, I just want to point everybody to my LinkedIn, and I promise you that I'm not like like because there's there's you know a bunch of other amazing creatives that were deeply involved with uh, with story and were architecting that story. My piece of it was the. Um, uh, was overseeing the open world content, the systemic content, that kind of thing. So when gotcha. I saw people saying narrative director leaves Halo, I'm like, oh God, no, no, please just just look a little bit deeper. I promise, it's not as devastating as you think. It's going to be fine. There's there's a continuity of talent there that will persist in with no problem whatsoever. But yeah, it was a uh, uh, it was it was strange. I have a I have a speaking of the narcissism thing, I have a Google alert for my name set up, and it's not because I'm desperate to see people talking about me. It's it's to make sure 
that I don't say something fucking dumb on Twitter uh, and then ha- and create news as a result. That is my eternal fear. So uh, so the first uh, when the first one popped up, I my heart fell into my stomach and I started freaking out. I was like, what did I do? Oh, my God. What did I do? Oh, I left my job. That's right. Okay, I did that. <laughs> something yeah. actually newsworthy. Yeah. I mean, you come yeah. from Games Press, right? At Destructoid? I do. Yeah. Destructoid, uh, brief stint at Shack News and some some freelancing and stuff then. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like an extra connection to Games Press these days or does it just feel like it's evolved so much since your era that it's just like, I don't even know what these people are trying to do. What, how are they getting clicks based off my name now? What is the world? <laughs> well, well, the, well the, the, the foundational aspect of all of it is that um, I was never good at being a games journalist. I see. Uh, so I, <laughs> so the connection that I feel is like, I still have friends that do it. You know, I, 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 I still have a great uh, deal of admiration for the work that goes on there that is so much better. Because Destructoid, for anybody watching this who doesn't know, uh, Destructoid's early early incarnation was very much fancied itself like the the the, the joke cracking kids at the back of the class throwing spitballs and things our our unofficial slogan was also cox i think for a long time and Classy. i still to this day don't know why uh-huh. um so uh it's i mean it's still the most uh, destructive is still probably the most important thing to happen to me in my career just because uh it without the relationships that i that i forged while i was working there i i would have had no career whatsoever. And that's in every direction. Like I, 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 you know, I was able to move on to Shack News from the connections that I made. And then uh, a, a buddy of mine that had himself been working in games journalism that ended up at Microsoft Game Studios working on the Gears 2 uh, website UX team actually got me my first in industry gig as a web content writer of all things. Like I was writing, I was writing blog posts for the Gears of War 2 website. And uh, none of that would have happened without Destructoid. It's, it's incredible how, how many like, pivot points in my career um, uh, are, are based entirely on 100% dumb luck. Just absolute, the dumbest luck. You know? I think that has to be everybody. I think if you say that it's not dumb luck, you're a f- maniac. You need to be yeah. put down. <laughs> well, you know, it was that plus a, just a heap of talent. And just all the, <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And it seems like with game narrative especially, the roots into game writing uh, the stories that i've heard and and the, the the stories that i that i've that i've watched unfold directly like some colleagues that i've had uh, over the years come from the most insane backgrounds and with the craziest roots in and it, it doesn't it, it very much it feels like it's changing because game writing roles are so are, are so much more ubiquitous than they were when i when i was starting out hmm. like um and certainly more than than when i was like in school when like you know the only like game uh writing a, a, like job posting that I was even scarcely aware of was the uh, was the localization writer editor positions at Nintendo, like the guys that work in the treehouse. Right. And and so like it's it's a different world now, but I imagine that it's got to be just as wacky and Byzantine for everybody that gets into this business. Like it's because you pretty much <laughs> it's there is there is no there is no like whenever anybody asks me about like for advice on how to get into game writing, I'm just like, well, rule one is don't believe anybody that says that there is one way in because they're lying to you. It's it it's just it's the most nonsense process like going to bridging that gap between having no experience and having some experience is an incredibly difficult one and yeah. i've heard so many different stories about how that how that tends to happen for people it's a it's madness yeah. all the time speaking of madness all the time um look it's great content but you're banging on your laptop or the table or something and it's it's like cloverfield over there <laughs> so oh my guess. god i'm so sorry <laughs> no, no. oh jesus right. yeah i, I apologize yeah I, uh, I will stop doing that i, I had my feet <laughs> up on the coffee table and i'm doing the leg jiggle thing because yeah. uh as as well yeah as 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 anybody related to the game informer stuff that i did with destructoid is probably aware uh anytime that i'm talking to anybody about anything even remotely serious about myself i uh i will fall into a black hole of of self-deprecation and self-consciousness so <laughs> i'm gonna keep my feet off of the hey man whatever you know, makes you comfortable that's fine um <laughs> so i met you uh when i was back at game informer and then we went on the cover story trip to visit gearbox yeah. uh for all about battleborn and i yeah. think because of that trip then i it is you are a case in point to my mind whenever people rag on a game because you have done such a good job of just tweeting every once in a while how proud you are of Battleborn. And I think like, you know, popular wisdom conventions like, oh, is that game that didn't work out? Whatever. Fart joke. Whatever. Moving on. <laughs> but like you just have done such a good job of being stop, like, stop quoting me to myself. OK, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but you've done such a good job of just like trying to convey like. You don't understand. Hundreds of people were very passionate about that game, and I'm very passionate about that game. And like, there's always this undercurrent, which I, I think is understandable, of like, you people lobbing, you know, grenades at Battleborn. You have never mm-hmm. tried that hard at anything in your life, as everybody on that team did. Like, f- 
you. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, uh, people are going to react to however they're going to react to stuff. And that's sure. fine. But Battleborn, uh, uh, I, I, uh, what, what you want to tell those people is like, dude, I can see nothing but the flaws in Battleborn. Right. Like, and that's true. I think of any developer that's ever worked on any game. It's like, you don't need to tell them, you know, this thing wasn't up to par. They know no one ships, uh, you know, a, 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 a less than, you know, nine out of 10 game because that's what they think people want and that's what they think they want to build. You know, like, um, uh, and Battleborn, you know, like when I say that I'm proud of the game, I, I do very, very genuinely believe it was, it was, it, to this day, it's the thing that was most personal to me. Uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, it was, it, oh my God, it was, uh, it, it was an extremely difficult uh, uh, project that I'm, and it's not that, it, I, I never even thought about it in that whole like, oh, it's so, you know, it's, it, well, it's mine, so of course it's going to be like my darling and that kind of thing. It's this thing that I, blah, blah, blah. I, I, there's, I've never, uh, I've never found myself in a position where I'm like, I look at any game, there, any game that I play, I can take something away from. And I feel like we, we provided a pretty unique experience that unfortunately happened to coincide with Overwatch. That was, that's, that's kind of been my takeaway is that, uh, if, I think the biggest mistake that we made was, was positioning ourselves as, as a, um, as a, as somehow a counterpoint to it or a competitor to it. We were a completely different game. It was a, it was a, like, and I think that's really borne out in uh, like over time that like, it's, it, it was a, it was an odd game. It was a personal game. It was, uh, well, how it was it. Oh, go ahead. How do you think you positioned yourself or Gearbox positioned itself as a counterpoint to Overwatch? I mean, was it? I'm trying to remember. Wasn't there some weird thing where like the beta for Overwatch was on the same day as a Battleborn they, launch date I think or they something? Launched, they, yeah, they launched their beta. Well, it, it, it came from both directions. They launched their beta on our uh, release date or something, something like, like that. that. I don't know. It's all blurred at this point. And there was also like, I think our. our our, <laughs> there was a tweet from our marketing department that was like "game on" or something at at, at Overwatch. And I was like, oh, "Oh, don't do that! They have more money than God. What are you doing? <laughs> like, like maybe not. Maybe let's position ourselves as like the cool, hip, you know, like you know, younger brother of Overwatch that you know has some, uh, ha, you know, has some personality flaws, but it tries really hard. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that that seemed not terribly advisable. But like, I think there was a there was a there was a I think there was an issue of like sort of the public perception of the game and like what we were trying to achieve. Um, it was, uh, it, you know, they, they were just, they couldn't have been more different. It would, it'd be, it'd be yeah. like comparing, uh, you know, TF2 to Quake. You know, it's just, well, that actually bears some comparison because TF2 was Quake, but you know what I mean. Right. Yeah. I think it's just, well, Hero Shooter, how many of these are really out in this era? At this point, it's such an easy comparison. It's like, I understand if you get into the, you know, fine details doesn't quite add up. Yeah. But from our well, perspective... And, and there were a flood of them at the time. You know, like, I, I felt bad because uh, right after we had announced, I think it was like a month after announced, uh, after we had announced, uh, Gigantic was announced. And they right. suffered exactly the same fate that we did. And I felt terrible for those guys because all the stories are the same. Like, we, you know, we dumped every inch of our passion into this game, you know, just to, just to, you know, land to very little fanfare because of the, so much of that attention was drawn in so many different directions. It was so loud during that period with, with Hero Shooters. So, you know, I, I think at a different time, uh, if circumstances, circumstances had been different, uh, maybe the game could have turned out differently, but uh, it was the, the hardest thing about Battleborn's failure was the fact that when the servers went down, the game went away. Yeah. Um, that's, that is to this day, the thing that just kills me the most. Like if I have kids, I'm never going to be able to show them the first game that I was lead writer on because it, it does not exist in any playable format. Uh, and from a broader perspective of like game preservation, that's heartbreaking. But, but, but when it's something that you've built with your own hands and that you, sl that you just really, really killed yourself over, uh, it it rings a, it it hits a little harder. So like any time a game goes offline, I pour one out for the developers that were involved in it because it's a really hard thing to watch go away. Like it's it's hard to watch all that effort go away. Do you remember early discussions about like that being baked in? I mean, isn't there was an option to just leave it in some ways so you can still play after the servers went offline, right? Like, mm -hmm. or at what yeah. point in the game's development was it clear that oh, once the servers are offline, this entire game is nuked? That was actually, I mean, that that was something that that obviously occurred to all of us like in development you know where um, because there was a, a deliberate decision was made to make the game online only for a variety of reasons that were you know founded in um business directives that kind of thing the big thing was you know uh we, we were hoping to create a, a live service game that had a long tail that that would be loot fueled and that kind of stuff and there is it's it's hard to create a space like that that doesn't require an online only you know that, that doesn't you know mandate an online only presence there are games that do it right uh we there are people that protested the decision was made and we move forward with it um and uh, and it's difficult to 
undo a lot of that architecture or to replicate a lot of that architecture if you were to move. So, like, basically, the in the lead up to when the game went offline, there was a bunch of people clamoring for, like, why can't you just patch it? Well, because it's, it's hard and expensive. And when Gearbox didn't make the decision to uh, uh, to make any sort of changes like that that would preserve the game in long term, it's like, I on one hand, I was heartbroken. On the other, I kind of got it because... Yeah. It's business, right? Like, and you know, Battleborn wasn't making them heaps of money, so you know, where's the where's the business case for making that investment? When I looked at it that way, it made a lot of sense to me. It's still hard not to feel like you know you, you lost a piece of yourself, you know, when something like that goes offline. Yeah, for sure. Well, what do you have? I mean, you have the YouTube videos. Do you have like the the script on some laptop somewhere, well, Google Docs, yeah, or what? Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, and I've got all that. I've got my. Um, I've got a, a, a big ass zip file with every single line of VO that we recorded. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I, but yeah, but the, the, the really heartbreaking thing was, you know, one of the one of the innovations that we that we achieved on the single player campaign for that game was, and this this came from uh, this this came entirely out of my my own reticence to make anybody listen to jokes that I wrote more than a couple times in a row um, because we wanted the game to be replayable. So so the way that I wrote the missions was. Uh, you know, every every block of dialogue would have redundant, you know, versions of itself with different characters that would speak and that kind of stuff. It would achieve the same thing from a moment to moment storytelling perspective. You know, we need to tell the player they got to go shut off this laser grid that's, you know, defending up um, that's that's protecting, a, a, a you know, like a vent shaft or something. And we're trying to get ingress into this place. But here are eight different ways that that part of the conversation could go down with some Easter eggs and that kind of stuff. And the idea was that every single time I'd play, I'd hear a different combination of those blocks. You know, so I'd be experiencing the same level, but I might have there might be different, you know, characters that would get different kinds of exposure. There'd be different aspects of story that would be revealed. Uh, the, the goal of which, which was my hope, was, you know, players can play this over and over and hopefully I'll forestall them getting sick of my dumb f***ing jokes uh, for, you know, a week or two before they start falling off. The the practical result of that, though, was that my scripts were insane. Like the uh, the, the first draft of the uh of the script for the algorithm, which is Isaac's level, was oh, I'm, my feet are up on the thing again. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, the algorithm, which was uh, which featured Isaac, one of the playable characters. The first draft of that script was 85 pages for for a for a 30 minute experience um, because it was just stacked with all of this extra dialogue that you know players might not ever hear because the combinatorics were such that you know you would have like a two percent chance of hearing this thing or this thing or whatever. And um, and that can't even be captured by a YouTube video, you know. So there's right. there's there are dimensions of narrative in that game that are I think are permanently lost, uh, you know, that can't be replicated by non-interactive experiences, and that 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 does kind of break my heart a little bit. Yeah. Why do you think that was yeah. the hardest thing you've ever worked on? Oh, because I had no idea what I was doing. Oh, I see. <laughs> I had I had absolutely no idea what do, what I was doing when you guys came down and interviewed me for the uh, for the cover story. I was in a state of complete terror. Um, I had uh, like, cause I, I, I had written for games before, but I'd never been a lead and I'd certainly never been a lead on a new IP. And, and I think, and having seen new IP development from other perspectives since then, I'm realizing just how specifically nuts Battleborn was because of the way that it was built. Because, you know, it was, it was leagues of creatives, you know, in art and, and design and, and in, in every discipline you could think of, like bringing, everything that they love to the table, like the, the, the concept, the stacks of concept art that are, that are uh, artists created were, were just, it was bananas and, and complete from like a, a hugely uh, disparate uh, piles of, you know, tone and, and interpretation and, and riffs on various other genres and that kind of stuff. And it was my job to, uh, to knit them all together in, in something that resembled narrative cohesion. And um, that would have been hard for me now. <laughs> then it was nuts. It was, it was the stupidest thing I ever I've ever done to think that I could do all that more or less on my own. Uh, and, but we did it and it was very, very hard, but oh my God, I would never do that alone again. Like I would, so I would hire on people to help me so fast, not just because it was a lot of work for one person. Um, uh, but because I, I understand now that there is only so much of your own voice you can put into a cast of 25 characters before you start running out of voices. Like I, <laughs> by the end of it, I was just like, Oh, who's this guy? He's an ice dude. Uh, I don't know. Let's make him really erudite and, and let's, let's, let's make him quote Shakespeare. I don't, I don't fucking know. Let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. Let's just run to the finish line. Let's just do it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in that sense, like I'll, I'll never work on a game as wild west as that one ever again. Like it will never be as just unhinged balls of the wall. Like, like every day there's a new 
unexpected challenge. Like, I don't think anything is going to be as crazy as that game was for me. So it's not a matter of like writer's block. It's just too much in your head at the same time, probably a bunch of note cards on a wall and you're just drowning in thoughts. Well, I, yeah, a little bit, but it's, it's more like, um, well, okay. So I, to go back to the characters as an example, like it's, it's, it's not so much writer's block as it is writer's utter exhaustion because there comes <laughs> a point where, you know, cause like the, the, cause the characters that we had, the first five that we rolled out were, what was it? Uh, uh it was, uh, it was Thorn, who was our space elf, you know, ranger badass. There right. was Caldarius, who was basically a mech. Uh, there was Oscar Mike, who was a uh, Call of Duty style. Like, basically, he was going to be the, the point of entry for people that enjoyed traditional shooters. Um, and a couple of other characters, you know, like, that, that felt archetypical. Mushroom? And I was like, Miko? What was the things? Yeah, that? Mik- yeah Miko okay. was one of them. Uh, and Wrath, I think, was the other one. Uh, the anime convention sword sword guy. And um, he, uh, uh, and, and all of those, like, archetypically felt very like I was like, okay, I know sort of what player expectation for these guys is going to going to be. Um, I, I know where creatively we want to go with it. We have a sense of what that high level story is going to going to be. So let's find ways to sort of make these guys our own. That, that was great for, for an initial, like a start out challenge for that game. That was awesome for the first five characters. By the time I got to the last, like the numbers 20 through 25, uh, where it was then was like, I'm out of ways. I'm one out of ways to talk about killing each, uh, killing other people I- in combat. Yep. Uh, I am, and I'm, I'm out of ways to create voices that were, that, that felt distinct and, and, and differentiated from other games where I, I, I felt like I got to the point where I was just like, I was, I was throwing darts against the board just because I, I had reached a point of just maximum exhaustion. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's where having a diverse set of voices in the writer's room actually comes to benefit you because, you know, it's 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 easier to, to to riff on stuff when you've got a couple of other brains in the room that have different perspectives in, uh, than you that that can bring different elements of comedy to it. Um, but by the time we got to the end of that slog, I was just like, like we did the DLC characters, and I actually just handed them off to Sam Winkler, who we hired on uh, late in Battleborn. Because I'm just like, please, I can't, I just can't at this point. Um, uh, and uh, and it it kind of broke something in me for a bit. Like it took me a little bit to kind of bounce back from it because I just felt like I had nothing left. You know, I just left it like pretty much all in the field. It was Eesh. a long, long couple of years. Yeah. And then reviews hit and people are saying, this VO is kind of annoying. And you're like, oh, God, <laughs> what have I done? Well, the thing actually, that was another thing that uh, important thing that I learned about comedy is that um, uh, somebody is always going to hate your jokes. Always. Like always. And also, you know, what really pissed me off was the fact that people were saying like, oh, it's this, more of this meme bullshit. Uh, right. like Borderlands 2 and I'm like dude there's not a single fucking meme in this video game and I'm, I'm rattling my shit again there's not a single meme in this video game did you even play the video game please tell me like like rip on my jokes is uncreative but at least like acknowledge they did you know like I'm not I'm not fucking, you know there's no I can't even think of a meme at this point there's no there's uh, I can't think of shit. I uh, that was I can take any amount of criticism for for anything that I do creatively. It, it did bug me that it felt like a lot of the people were just going after it because it was a Gearbox product, because it was yeah. a follow-on for Borderlands, you know, and, and primarily because, like, I think just comedy, you're just asking for people to hate your shit. Plenty of people hate the Halo grunts. Like, lots really? of them do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because, well, and, and, and the most commonly cited reason that I've been reading is, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have this, you know, high-octane sci-fi epic experience and and here comes all these little dorks that are just you know saying stuff about how how they hope the human afterlife sucks and that kind of thing. And it's like, well, that's kind of always what Halo has been, or at least that's always what Halo has been to me. Like Halo has always been an extraordinarily funny game to me. Um, so I, I didn't feel like I was stepping out of line with it, but but there were plenty of people, uh, lots of people that that in forums and that kind of thing. Uh, that uh, were were not huge fans of it, and and that kind of deepened my confirmation that like if you're gonna try to be funny, just expect that people are gonna tell you just don't do that. Like there is, and I and I don't know how to please those people because it's like, you know, you build something you know like that that feels, I guess for the most part, in my head, like I felt like we were advancing a little bit. We were making the guns uh, grunts a little more aggressive, uh, in terms of their characterization. We were making them a little more, you know having them have a sense of a little more a deeper, deeper equity in what they were doing. So we were moving it a little bit, but it still didn't feel like that much of a departure. And yet there were people saying like, this isn't Halo. And I'm like, then, then, then what is, like, what is Halo? <laughs> right. You are familiar like, with how goofy grunts were out of the gate. Yeah. You've heard the voice yeah. since the first game. Like, did you ever have like tone checks internally of just like, Hey, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean like, and that was kind of a, that that was kind of everybody's job, you yeah. know. Like I, I I got feedback from all over the team about like, 
Well, actually, you know, it was the, the, the moment of confirmation to me because the, probably the single greatest outlier that the, uh, tonally uh, that, that we included in Halo Infinite was Glibnub, the, propa- the propaganda grunt. And that felt like the, when I when we when we settled down to, to add VO to the propaganda towers, like that my first my first and only impulse was it's got to be a grunt. It has to be a grunt because uh, from a from a fictional perspective, the grunts know the most about human language and human culture. So it, it follows then that they would be the perfectly they, they would be perfectly positioned to, you know, to piece the, all the remaining UNSC personnel apart emotionally. It felt like that was like the most appropriate way to do it. But I remember like as I was writing it, I was like, OK, well, this stuff's getting pretty dark and uh, it's getting kind of mean. And uh, and I have no idea how anybody's going to react to it, but we'll record it. We'll get it in the build and we'll see how people react. And I had this like. I had a flood of, of notes from various members of the team uh, uh, just saying, like, this is really dark and I'm really liking it. And I was like, OK, well, cool. So long as like because it felt like we were all kind of everybody has kind of a sense of, of, of what that franchise is and what it should be. Uh, and and part of the process is all of us coming together sort of, it, you know, to uh, to lock down kind of what what feels on rails to us and what feels like a departure. Uh, and and that immediate reaction, I was like, okay, I feel like we have something here. I feel like we have something that is that is that is new to this franchise, but carries forward the spirit of it. And uh, and that was a that was a huge relief, um, uh, getting that that feedback back because that felt like I felt like if there was any point at which I was going to uh, to to run afoul of of sort of you know gamers broadly their expectations of Halo, it felt like Glibnub was going to be it. But uh, he's like people love that shit. It, it, it which is so gratifying to me because it was so much fun to write yeah i think i saw didn't you tweet something about how you pulled lines a couple lines from battleborn that you wrote into hail infinite as well just to really merge these two yeah well yeah i plagiarized jokes for myself yeah yeah <laughs> well and that was and yeah the idea with that was like hey if battleborn doesn't exist anymore then these jokes these jokes that i really loved are going to live on in some form so there's like two it's like uh something like a grunt will say something about like Let's see what your bones look like without all that skin and junk on them. And I think there's um uh was it like a grunt launch line or something? There's just a few peppered in. And and that was just that was just me, you know, being uncreative and not having any ideas and, and, <laughs> and, and feeling I actually one of the reasons I did it was because I realized that I did it accidentally at one point. And it was the 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 let's let's see what your bones look like without all the without all the skin hanging off them line. And I was like, you know what? No, it's staying. It's staying. I'm fine. I'm 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 cool with that. Nobody's going to be able to verify it against the game anyway. The game's gone. It's fine. It, that it's plagiarism no longer applies in this case. Interesting. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so when you joined uh, the Halo team, what when was that, and what was like your main responsibility? What was your goal there? Oh yeah. So the um uh when did I join? That was uh it was like. I want to say like August of 2019, I think okay. is around about the time that it was. And my uh, responsibility coming uh, coming on as lead narrative designer was all of the open world and ancillary content. So that included the uh, I, I oversaw the development of all of the all of the chatter in the game, um, uh, the audio logs, the, uh, the the side content, the outposts, and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, oh, oh, and more. Oh, and uh, propaganda grunt. All the systemic dialogue. So anytime the, the the weapon is is saying stuff that we're sourcing from a big bucket of dialogue, so she can react to stuff in the open world, all that stuff was mine. And uh, I, I did do a little bit of uh, mission writing and some some help on some of the cinematics, but that was a smidge compared to the big pile that was basically all of the open world stuff. Yeah, uh, and that's your passion. Still is with the uh, battle chatter. Yeah, well, I mean, it's <laughs> I have a I have an interesting relationship with battle chatter because um, the day that uh, someone hands me a big pile of work to do and it's volume writing like anything like battle chatter i I will go through probably like an hour long uh um uh uh stages of grief kind of progression where i'm just like oh god i can't like how many lines do we need 750 oh that's so much god i'm so tired and uh, like uh but the thing is and i remember this by the time i'm done with any with any one of those assignments is that that's like where where I get passionate about that shit is because that's that's where the player is going to be spending ninety five percent of their time is in the sandbox, totally. right? And and you can convey such a such a potent sense of world and character through the incidental incidental and ancillary stuff. Like the thing that I um and I I, I tweet about this as well. So apologies for anybody that's been stalking me on Twitter because I'm just repeating myself. The um one of my very favorite things uh in video games generally is uh the defective tur- uh, turret in Portal Two, and the reason I love it is because that's a character that you spend um 
I don't know, in an average playthrough, if you're just playing the game, maybe you'll spend 45 seconds to a minute with that character. But they recorded like five solid minutes of dialogue for the defective uh, for the defective turret. So yeah. if you were so inclined just to sit there and listen for, for 10, 20 minutes, you would hear the most banana sh- come out of this thing. And um and and even if you're only encountering it for a couple of seconds, you know, it still it adds so much character to that universe that I, I think people really underestimate the amount of actual labor and work that that Chatter does in imparting a sense of tone and imparting a sense of character. So I it's it's hateful work. <laughs> it's uh, volume writing is hateful work because you know there are only so many ways to say that you're reloading a gun or that somebody's over there. But like, but if you can write to um whatever specific sandbox that you're working with, you know, uh, Team Fortress 2 is my guiding light on that because Team Fortress 2 was the first time that I ever saw a, a strictly multiplayer only game just drip with character um, and, 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 a, and a really refined sense of a world that surrounded them um, while providing no structured content to give you that sense. I mean, this was well before like all the man versus machine stuff and, and some of the world building they did, the, the bread stuff. Uh, you know, when it was just Battle Chatter, like it, it, it felt like a complete universe and you can do that with just Chatter. So it's, I, I, I am passionate about it. I hate doing it while I'm doing it. But I love having done it when it's done. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been fascinating, yeah, to just see that reaction where, you know, it, the game launches and everybody says, hey, uh, hookshot, grapple beam, awesome. What do you, what is the, what is the, help me out. Hookshot, what is that thing called in the game? Oh, the grapple hook. Grapple, grapple hook. hook, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Exact terminology. <laughs> um, it's like that. And then also, this game is surprisingly funny. These grunts are hilarious. And it's like, it's interesting yeah. just to see, at least from my perspective, it was shocking that, like, oh, it's interesting that this is the takeaway. That it's like, it turns out of all the things in the game, the larger story, when it comes down to writing, a lot of times people just want something that really impacts them. And that really hit them. Well, so I had, I, and I think what that comes down to is that I had the easier job, right? Mm. Um, everybody will scrutinize plot right. to, the, to, the, to the nth degree. Everybody will piece apart like every, every last sentence of a cinematic. But, you know, when you're dealing with a pile of 17,000 lines that can fire randomly and that kind of stuff, there's a... There's a there's a phenomenon known as apophenia, which is the the uh, the human brain's uh, tendency to see structure and pattern where there is none. Sure. Um, and uh, and I, I swear to God that 90 percent of the reason people enjoy the battle chatter has to be just that because they see connection and 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 uh, and and purposeful execution where there absolutely was none. Like the uh, there's a there's a really simple call and response system in Halo Infinite Chatter that is not multi-layered. It's it's like basically like a grunt can it, it, there's there are sets of lines in which characters can respond to other specific line types uh, as they're firing. So for example, um, a grunt might there's a set of lines that are just taunt Spartans. So anytime the the the, the grunt is going to talk at the Spartan, they just say like, ah, you're, you know, you're bad at driving. Uh, and that can cue a, that can cue a line from a response set that, uh, that we, you know, really didn't write, we didn't break our backs trying to write it in a way that was going to avoid non sequitur. We wrote just stuff like, ha yeah, you know, that's the kind of grammar I, oh no, what, what was it? It was, it was grammar like that is going to, what's going to win the war, I think was one of the lines. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, and I've seen people react to it as though, like they say, like, I think I heard what I thought was a scripted conversation where this happened and this happened and this happened. I was like, we deserve n- the only people that deserve that the credit for that are our narrative system designers that set the system up and 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 tuned it that way. Because, right. uh, it, you know, that was that was not an authored thing at all. So, like, I, you know, I, I feel like we very much had <laughs> myself and Jeff Easterling, we had the easier part of the job where it's, you know, all you're doing is providing scaffolding and and. um uh, and and sort of window dressing for the for the already inherently funny and engaging experience that they already have. Like the the Halo sandbox is the most is the most fun I've ever had writing for a video game because the Halo sandbox is inherently absurd, right? Like there's yeah. there is an inherent absurdity to that. Um, and so yeah, no, we uh, I my uh, my colleagues Paul Crocker, Dan Chosich, um, uh, Joseph Staten uh, did an absolutely phenomenal job. Uh, at uh, doing what I think is an impossible job, which yes. is creating a campaign that's going to please as many Halo fans as possible. That is an inherently difficult task. Uh, I, I feel like we had the the easier part of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you make it seem like it was all just cracking jokes and being silly, but there's also a big part of your job, I imagine, about like, okay, we need you to reinforce this narrative beat from the main campaign in the sandbox and you have weapon guide people mm-hmm. towards this remind them of what's going on is there's still a lot of that kind of lore subtle lore heavy lifting right oh for sure yeah and and you know uh well yeah a big part of that was the fact that just the 
one of the things that I loved the most about the project when I came aboard was this idea that that the Marines uh, had been stuck on Zeta Halo for six months before you even arrive, right? So there is right. all of this built-in history that you could remark on. And like, and it stands to reason that the people that are left over, and I think this is true, this is just as true of the Banished as it is of the of the UNSC, is that the people that are still hanging on are like, they're the grittiest of the, of you know, uh, of who's left, right? They're they're the folks that have just done whatever they had to to survive, and and there's so many there there are so many elements of that that we were able to to emphasize and surface um, uh, with just the incidental chatter. Like uh, you know, players might have noticed that when the grunts talk, sh they talk an awful lot about all the people that Master Chief has lost or abandoned, because there's been this big big gulf of time where, as far as anybody knew, Chief was Chief was killed in action, and and. And to be able to, to give a sense, like Halo's always had one of the one of the central components of, of Halo has always been military reverence, right? This idea that that you know that and the Marines have always been the central uh, point of emphasis for that towards the player because they're the ones that can kind of stand in reverence and awe of Chief. But for this game in particular, I felt like we were really uniquely positioned to go further than that because the Marines themselves had been through so much. Like and so every that that was everything that we did in the open world, all of the logs and such. We were trying to tell that story of like what what does six months of continuous fighting and chaos look like, and and what kind of what kind of characters does that create? Like what sort of personas result from that? And that that informed everything we did, from the Marines to the uh, to the banished chatter to the propaganda grunts to the audio logs. That's that was the core story we were trying to tell. Like what what does that look like? You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. What uh, what did the delay? In the game, provide you and the and the writing team. What are the what are the what now? The delay. Oh well, um, uh, quite a bit. You know, like I'm. Well, I mean, we actually. Sorry, I I misspoke. Not much because we were. <laughs> the game was so close to. Um, uh, we you know I can't speak for for all departments, but I know that we had opportunities to shore up the things that we were already really excited about. The propaganda grunts came online at that point. The 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 notion of of adding VO to the to the towers generally uh, came from Joseph Staten. So that the turnaround time on that was was actually really brief. Well, like we had it written and recorded in like a month. Oh wow. Um, yeah. So uh, so we actually didn't get it was where a lot of that time went uh, was to uh, was was the, those like uh, finer points of refinement, at least from a narrative perspective. Um, but uh, for the most part, our plans were already largely in place. Um, uh, it, it didn't shift around much for me and my team. Okay. Could you feel like a yeah. collective sigh of relief when it came down that, hey, this is happening? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I know I did just because, yeah. it, you know, who doesn't want more time, right? You know, who doesn't, <laughs> who, who doesn't, uh, you know, want to give everything they possibly can to a project as it's in motion. So yeah, I, I, it was, it was nice for me. Yeah. Yeah. Being on the inside of that team, were there, um, were there big beats or just misconceptions out there in the public discourse, uh, public discourse about Halo Infinite that, that drove you nuts? You mean like in terms of the story? No, no, no. Like during the game's development even. I mean, during oh, the delay, oh, oh. everything like that, where you're just watching it like, <laughs> oh, people have the you know, worst idea about this. Well, without getting into specifics, uh, I mean, that's frustrating on every project that I'm on because I feel like there's a, I feel like we're in this, we're in a place now where um, so much of the development process is surfaced so directly to players and, and there's so much inside baseball discussion that happens on like message boards and that kind of thing. Like you look at like something like reset era, a lot of very, 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 very knowledgeable uh, uh, gamers and developers and such that, that talk about the process of making games, but there are so many incredible assumptions uh, yes. that, that are made during that discussion that like, and, and of course you want to say, but just be like, well, no, it's not, not actually like that, but you know, we, we can't do that. So you just kind of have to watch it go and just be like, okay, you know, believe what you want. Like the, uh, the, uh, the thing that was frustrating about uh, leaving the, uh, uh, about leaving 343 was with that that litany of articles that went up was like I can't go in and correct every single person you know <laughs> who says that that the that the sole narrative architect for this game is like no 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 that's not true at all not at not in the least what you know um and but there's you know it just it just happens you just kind of have to let it happen and watch it happen and ignore it the best you can I browse a, a lot fewer uh game forums now for that reason it's because it'll drive you insane a little bit yeah but also like and and I mean in turn that's also you know really informed my own reactions to games and my own reaction to especially games that that um, if I'm if I'm disappointed by something like my reaction is never to criticize it my action my reaction is always to imagine you know what was the the path of decisions and circumstances that led to that eventuality because like I said earlier like no one sets out to 
to to build in you know a disappointing aspect of a game you know like it just you know there are reasons that that happens it's like you want to tell everybody that but uh you also don't want to be you know fired so there's that kind of fine line that you have to watch <laughs> what was it like when you learned that you're probably going to get to work with uh joe satan oh that was f- cool that was that was getting him in the booth uh was a, a supremely surreal moment um and and i i you know it's funny i've been doing this long enough that i i like to think that i'm i'm uh uh, that I'm I'm in near to getting like star starstruck and that kind of thing. I totally wasn't because like as soon as he started doing the voice, I was like, holy sh! That's Joseph State and reading my <laughs> reading my dumb stuff. Like, oh my god, um, it was it was phenomenal. He's a he's an incredible talent um, and a, and a and a wonderfully warm human being, uh, just like everybody else on that goddamn video game. Like I that that team uh, really really put its back into that game. Everybody from from the bottom up, and uh, it was it it's it's a really good team. Yeah. Yeah, did you learn anything uh, about writing from Joe Staten, or was it mainly just, eh, main interaction was just when he was jumping in the booth? Well, it, it, timing-wise, he came online uh, uh, as we were kind of wrapping stuff up, so we, right. we worked together a lot on the propaganda grunt stuff, and and I did learn quite a bit from him, because uh, he has one of the more interesting uh, vocal cadences uh, that I've ever worked with, and and after, and this is true of, like, I think any, any character that, I, I, one thing I say frequently is, like, I never know how to write a character until I have you know, until the voice talent is in the booth and we're kind of figuring it out together because there's so much of the, of the minutia of, especially for a comedic character, so much of that comes out in just in, in the, the, the most subtle nuance of delivery that like, until I hear it in the booth, it's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. But after that first session, I'm like, great. I know exactly who this character is. I know exactly where we want to go with it. Uh, and we have an awesome and phenomenal and fun time. Like collaborating with voice talent generally is is my favorite part of this job. Getting it to do it with Joseph Staten was a, a fucking trip. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think there's kind of like, in, in interviews, Staten's like, ah, I, you know, when I came on board, I didn't really rework things in a big way. And I just assumed that was nonsense. Like, I think from the outside, looking at the structure of Halo Infinite story, it feels like the type of game where it's like, it's structurally such a funky narrative, <laughs> by right. and large, that like, surely there was a large rearranging of items. But from your perspective... That was not the case, not not in not in terms of the content that I was working on, and and I'm sure Staten or Crocker can could talk at length about you know ways of that change in the back end, but but at least for me for the yeah. for the open world and ancillary stuff, yeah, it was um the 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 biggest impact that um uh <laughs> that that Staten had on on my work was was definitely the propaganda growth stuff, but also just like not like I was really th- thrilled when he didn't when he did not come to me and say everything you've done here is garbage uh, that was a really <laughs> that was a very very rewarding moment for me um uh but yeah but, but getting to uh kick out the jams with him on the on the glibnup stuff is still like an absolute career highlight for me that's awesome uh how are you feeling about the game before it launched were you able to see mock reviews or have some sense of what people were going to think of it oh um uh you know i i think <laughs> uh I wasn't, I, I didn't really, well, I hadn't actually seen much of that and I didn't go looking for it because I, I felt more confident about infinite before launch than I think any other project that I've ever been on. Yeah. Um, because it was, and I've, 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 and I've said this in other circumstances before, it is by far the most fun video game I've ever had the privilege of working on. And, and that is a testament to just like, again, going back this, the halo sandbox is, Oh God, it's so good. And, uh, so like, as, as things were coming together and as we were starting to land the thing, I mean, this is beneath, you know, miles of the usual kind of work stress that you feel, you know, launching anything. Um, but I had this, I had a, a fairly deep conviction that what we had done was something that was special and, uh, and, and, and felt like a, it, it felt to me like a damn good Halo game. Um, I have long since learned not to trust my own feelings on anything, but um, uh, I, I had a sense that, that it was going to be good. And privately, I was like, I'll just take an eight. Give me an eight. And that's uh, that's fine. You know, be as ruthless as you want, but just give us an eight. An eight would be great. Um, uh, but uh, when, when when it came out and the reviews hit, I was just I was overjoyed, but I also felt vindicated because I was like, yeah, this is I I knew we had something. I I knew it was a damn fine Halo game, and uh, and I feel like that bore out. So yeah. I'm pretty proud of it. Well, that's awesome. Are you? Is there anything that you're surprised people aren't talking about more? Like, oh, I really thought this was going to be the main discussion point for story beat or a bit of writing in this game, and no one's really talking about it. Ah, uh, you know, I think the only thing that I'm I'm kind of surprised about is that, you know, actually no, because <laughs> I, because every like looking through comments and stuff, 
again, this goes back to just how like how I don't think there's a there's a fan base out there that is more tenacious at getting at the even the most minor details as the Halo community. Like they found everything, everything we thought we were super clever about hiding, all the stuff that we hid systemically, all the all the skull dialogue, everything. Like all of that was kind of like laid bare within like the first week, um, <laughs> which which was incredible like uh i i then it occurred to me i was like oh yeah this is what this is this is kind of the experience when you have the the kind of reach that 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 the halo as an ip has like that's how many eyes you get on your stuff it's it's still to this day just the craziest freaking thing yeah it's like you got to take the good with the bad you know i'm sure they were yep. bummed out by the delays and everybody has a thought on progression and multiplayer and it's like well, at the same time a lot of people are yeah. quoting those grunts so i guess it's worth yep. it yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. For, and for my part specifically, like it was, it, it was extremely gratifying that, that people responded so well to it when it comes to the things about the delays and like, and, and, and business decisions and that kind of stuff, yeah. I try to ignore that because I have absolutely no control over it. And if I thought about it for any more than five minutes, I'd stress out really hard. And, you know, and there's, that's, I, I think everybody working in game development has that same issue where it's like, you know, it is a massive enterprise. You yeah. know, there are so many interests, there are so many variables there's so much that has to be done. Uh, it, in my mind, it's it's a marvel that any AAA game ships. It's incredible that any AAA game ships. Well, you know? that's that's the thing that I, I kind of want your perspective on. Like, how different was it to go to 343? Did you feel like you were part of a much larger machine here compared to anything else you've worked on? Well, I mean, yes and no, but because like I had uh, just prior to 343, I'd come from Bungie, and and Bungie yeah. is uh, Bungie was was my first. Uh, exposure to a, a studio of 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 that size and intensity in terms of its live service model. Um, I, I, pr- prior to that, I was at ArenaNet, which was also a live service model and incredibly intimidating because it was such a well-oiled machine, right? Like um, that that like not only is it's it's hard to ship games. It's really 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 hard to ship games on a three month cadence with like three teams running in parallel, right? It's it's incredible every time I encounter it because I. This is why I'm not a producer. I can't hold more than one or two tasks in my head at any given time. And uh, um, going into Bungie, especially because Bungie is at the time was the the largest studio I had ever joined. And in the um, uh, at at Bungie, there's a there's a couple of different you know uh, like there's a there's a there's an office that's just up the road there. There's a separate office, but in their in their main uh, in their main development pit, basically, it's this massive massive room with just rows of desks as far as you can go. And I'm like, holy. Sh- Everybody here is like at the absolute top of their game. What the hell am I doing here? Do they know I'm a fraud yet? Will they find out? Like, who do I have to bribe and or kill to make sure that that doesn't get out? Um, uh, it's still like, and I, I actually feel that way about every, pretty much every team that I join. Um, uh, because it's at a certain level of seniority, there's like the, the, the talent that you encounter and the, and the, the backgrounds that people bring to their work, like the, all the stuff they worked, like, you, you join a new team and you're like, you worked on this game. That's like my favorite thing ever. Oh my God. You worked on this it's the same deal. It's like, it's, it never ends. There's, there's so many absolutely incredible people working in this business. And every time I join a studio, I'm terrified of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why did you decide to leave two for three? Oh, uh, uh, a really compelling new opportunity at right. I, uh, I, it was it, like, and it was a really hard decision to make, but like, um, I, uh, I, I, I've had, uh, the good fortune to work on a number of games uh, in a litany of different genres over my career. And um, and the project that, that I'm on now is a really special one that I'm very excited about. And I think people are going to be really, I think, I think when, when the game is announced, people are going to be like, Oh yeah. Okay. I see why. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's, but you know, it again, like it's, this is true of like every studio I left. It's a really, it's always a really hard decision to make. Um, uh, but you know, there's always something new to learn and new to experience. And I'm, I'm big into that. And now I'd imagine you get new coworkers that'll be like, you worked at Bungie? What is that like? Tell me everything. I've, every time that happens to me, I'm like, oh yeah, my part of it was garbage. It's fine. It's just, it, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I, I lean back on the self-deprecation stuff. But yeah, that's, that actually, um, I had uh, a colleague of mine reached out about, about Infinite in the, uh, uh, in the first couple of days after I had joined up. And I just like melted into a puddle. Like, cause that was like the, the coolest validation you can hear from the people that have done the coolest shit that you've ever played. Uh, it, it, that that sticks with you. I I, I wrote that shit down. I was like, I'm going to remember this. I'm just going <laughs> to put that in my hope chest. You know, <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, it has to feel great to have Halo Infinite on the resume for the rest of your life, and know that hey, for the rest of time, people will be talking about until the sun disappears. Uh, people will be talking about like, hey, that grunt chatter in Halo Infinite that was pretty funny. 
Yeah. <laughs> yep, I got that going for me. I'll have that printed on my tombstone. Uh, wrote <laughs> wrote a handful of okay jokes for Halo Infinite. No, no, but you know, no, you're right. I um uh I am so proud of that game. It's it's absurd. Like um it's uh I and to this day, like I can't. I remember one of the first press press trips I got to take uh, when I was at Destructed was going down to Bungie um, to play Halo Three at their offices. Oh wow. And um, and I, I remember when when the game shipped, I thought to myself, like, dude, if I could go back in time and tell that idiot version of me, well, which is I'm I'm still an idiot, but that particular idiot version of me, uh, that 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 one day I would have that same experience um, from, but from the other side of the perspective is like, it still blows my mind. Like at my career is so top to bottom unlikely that like every milestone that I hit, I'm just like that's bullshit. Like there's no no one like is is that lucky, and yet somehow I have continued to be that lucky and uh it it's it's never not insane to me like i every time i, I I've, I've got my my copy of halo on my shelf and every time i look at it i'm just like that's stupid that's the dumbest thing i can't i cannot believe that actually happened like i'm <laughs> i'm i'm an extremely lucky person well hey congratulations man looking forward to see what you do next Thank you, sir. Appreciate yes, that. Absolutely. And thank you so much for watching or listening to this interview. You can always subscribe to Minimax's YouTube channel for more like it. Um, Aaron, do you want to do a goodbye, a big sign off for folks? Sign off any way you want, man. Uh, g- g- good, goodbye. There we go. I did it. <laughs> Kill yeah. It. Bye, everybody. St- still got that win. Yes. <laughs> Nailed right. it. Bye, everybody. <laughs> If you are sick of snark, clickbait, and an avalanche of movie news, you can help support independent games media by subscribing to MinMax's YouTube channel here or checking out the benefits over on Patreon. It's a nice, clean handshake. You support us, and we won't make dumb, condescending stuff for you. Your support helps us continue our mission of focusing on games, friends, and getting better. Patreon.com slash MinMax with two N's. We'd appreciate it.